So those are my comments. And now we have uh, uh, Dr. Bramlage will uh, return to the stage. He has a, a presentation I've been waiting to see, and I just can't, can't wait, don't have to wait anymore. Dr. Larry Bramlage. Well, thanks, Ed. Um, some of you may, some of this is a repeat or maybe an integration of what I talked about last year uh, as far as Bones' response to training only. I'm gonna try to go into a little more depth. Ed asked me the question, should we be training in both directions? In other words, the, do we pay a penalty in the US for training horses only left-handed? Um, and the answer is, Maybe. Thank you. It's been nice being here. Uh, now I'll try to go through what some of the evidence that exists, and it probably does make more makes some sense, but it's not, not an absolute thing. This is what I was talking about. I put these in because I figured we'd be talking about this in the um, uh, as far as durability of the horse and our old horses. Uh, excuse me, are our ho current horses less durable than they used to be? And this is from the 2009 um, Jockey Club Roundtable. Um, this one's probably the actual, actually the mo easiest one to understand. This is all from when the Jockey Club had data that we could mine from 1977 forward. <clears throat> and if you look at the age starters, which we defined as five years old and up, as a percentage of the entire um, racing population and in the earnings, um, that, that's a percentage of the starts, these age starters. Um, it runs about 30% and it doesn't change through the whole time. So good, productive, older horses stay productive and they stay in the racehorse population. Where, where they get weeded out is that the, the young horses we don't have and we can't have as much patience as maybe once upon a time we could have because racing purses and the cost of racing horses is in such a mismatch, especially when you start talking about comparing the 1940s and 1950s when it was the purses that was the goal. And Todd spoke of this essentially breed, uh, racing to breed. In addition, the percentage of the foal crop to race is climbing. So in the early 1980s, the, the, when the foal crops were in the 50,000 and a higher percentage of them racing, and essentially the pipe that we're squeezing them through, which is the number of racing opportunities times the number of starters in a race, um, the average field size has only varied one horse since the 1950s. It's gone from um, about eight horses to field to down to about seven. So we're trying to screw, squeeze a bigger crop through a smaller pipe, or through the same size pipe, and get them out the other side. And the ones that fall, fall off the edge are the ones that aren't productive. If they're good, productive racehorses, they stay in the population and keep racing. So, so much for that. Now the lesson on bones. A bone was once thought to be inert, and actually whenever I went to school, some of the histopath we took as a sophomore, we learned that um, a bone was relatively inert substance. But it could say anything other than that with the racing thoroughbred. Now the skeletal phenotype, that's what the horse looks like when he's born and grows up without any influence, is, is similar, and that is you recognize a thoroughbred from being not a draft horse. But the refinement and the biomechanics in the racehorse, what makes a thoroughbred racehorse so good is he can actually make his skeleton into a racehorse skeleton. Now, it's probably not unique to the thoroughbred. If you trained other um, breeds in the same way, you'd probably get the same thing. But how does it occur? Well, there's two cell populations. And I, I'm going to apologize to Jamie McLeod. If you need to get out your air sick bag for what I do to uh, the basic science of bone, he's, he's so far over my head. But I'm going to try to interpret it as a surgeon would interpret it. In that pink slide up there, you see the surface of a bone and that layer of cells are osteoblasts and they produce the substance of bone and then they get trapped in it. And when I was a student, that's as much as we learned. The, the, the osteo, 
Blasts become osteocytes and they're trapped in the bone and they live there for the rest of their life. Amen. It couldn't be farther from the truth. So the question is, is the osteocyte a prisoner or a director? As it turns out, the osteocyte is actually the director of what mostly happen, happens inside bone. And the way that occurs is in, in that picture that's gray, the gray is the calcified, uh, I'm sorry, the brown is the calcified bone and the osteocyte is pictured in the middle. It has all these projections. And the green picture, if you digest all the bone away, that's what the osteocytes look like talking to each other. And the key are all those processes that stick out from each osteocyte to another osteocyte and they all communicate. And if you cut them off from their communication, the bone starts to remodel really aggressively. If you leave them intact and you overload the bone, they'll add more bone. They direct the situation going on. Um, there, it, here's a slightly different picture. The canaliculi are those uh, canals in between where the dendrites ta uh, connect all the osteocytes. It's a re real orchestra. And not only does it control the bone, but it controls the calcium levels in the horse. And calcium is real important. It, it's, it has to be controlled within small levels. And you can imagine the amount of surface increase from all of those um, dendrites that are sticking out from each cell to where if you need cells... If you need calcium, they can digest it very rapidly and make it available to the circulation, or they can lay down bone. Those dendrites sense mechanical loads, and they allow the rapid dissolution or formation of bone in response to systemic needs. Now, if you look at the picture that's on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, drawn around the margins of those um, little um, lacunae that the cells are within, they can add bone or subtract bone in that location quickly. And that increases the density of the bone. The brown circles are what are called um, secondary remodeling canals. And those brown circles are newer than the white bone that they're involved in. I'm gonna talk some more about, about that here in a minute. Now, bone is a composite material, but the compression load is resisted by the crystals. And it's a hydroxyapatite crystal, and so it's subject to a lot of the laws of physics that other crystals are. If you look at the pink picture, the really dark pink picture is old bone. The light pink is new bone. So it moves from a less dense, dense substance to a more dense substance over time. And then again, you look at the, at the picture with the brown circles. Those are secondary remodeling canals that have cut through old bone and replaced it. They can actually cut through damaged bone and replace it with normal bone. And, and that picture up there in the blue shows the cells in their job. The red cells are cutting holes through the bone and the blue cells behind it are filling it in. Now, bones not formed directly. Um, osteoblasts form osteoid and then they secrete the minerals that causes it to mineralize. Now, it's not instantaneous. It increases in density over time and we get to talking about two-year-old shins. That's important. So bone can become stronger and less ductile over time. <clears throat> stronger is a, is a good thing. Less ductile means it's stiffer. Um, it's stronger, but it's more subject to uh, biomechanical loads and stress fractures. Now let's stop for a minute with the osteoclast. Those are the bone eaters. They'll eat up bone if you don't need it. Along, where the pink picture is, it shows a diagram of, a, of an osteoclast eating a hole in the bone. But also the, the red canals are what happens when you have a crack in bone. If it's a stable crack, the osteoclast in the cartoon where it says 50 microns there, um, the osteoclast are the red cells. They'll cut a canal across that fracture, which is in the middle of the orange and uh, brown picture or in that instance, it's an, actually an osteotomy, but um, they'll cut a canal across that and cement it in with a column of bone. They sort of peg it together. And that's how microfractures are fixed in bone. So both cells have a, a um, very important role to play. Most of the time in the young training horse, we're dealing with osteoblasts and osteocytes. Secondary remodeling isn't, doesn't go on um, very aggressively, which I'll get to in a minute. Now, osteoclasts are controlled by hormones, which um, those of you that have mothers and um, 
relatives that deal with, os with uh, osteoporosis know that. You can, the parathyroid hormone, calcitonin, and other hormones can drive osteoclasts to absorb bone. Actually, sometimes absorb bone to the detriment of the patient. The other thing that causes osteoclasts um, to be stimulated is the abs absence of osteocytes. If you kill the osteocytes at a site, the osteoclasts are going to come in. So the osteocytes have a huge regulation role. Now, options for increasing bone strength in response to training. You got modeling and remodeling. Modeling is easiest to understand. That picture on the left is the right hind cannon bone of a thoroughbred um, two-year-old, no, actually three-year-old, um, that we cut in half and, and looked at it for, I don't know what reason we, uh, we were looking at it. But the thing that amazed me was the clarity with which you can see the modeling of the bone. The horse actually produced that bone to best neutralize the stress that it saw. And look how much of it occurs. I'm going to come back to that. The, the, the original bone is that central symmetrical hollow core. That's what it looked like as a yearling. Now remodeling occurs in areas, especially in areas where you can't change the size and shape, you have to change the substance. And so we're going to talk some of that related to joints. Equine modeling is extreme in a poster child for the adaptation of a bone. This is a project that I'm just going to refer to um, uh, for a basic understanding, and that's what Sue Stover did with her study on full bone to um, weanlings that are walking around. Horses that add bone to what they're born with. And you can see it's added in a sort of lace-like fashion where you produce those little columns and then you fill them in, but there's often an area where the differential stiffness doesn't fully fill in. And that's those dark holes. Um, I, I, don't, I should have been smart enough to bring a pointer, but I wasn't. That has to do when we come back to talking about training left-handed. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. So remodeling, in the normal situation, in you or I, the remodeling is going on by secondary osteons all the time. But if you, when you get in a real heavy stress situation, remodeling will slow because you can't afford to take bone away. And the horse switches only to making bone or primarily to making bone. Therefore, in periods of high stress, when the osteoclasts are turned off, it creates an exercise debt. In other words, you're going to get little cracks in the minerals of the bone, which we'll, we'll talk about in some detail, and they'll stay there until the horse has the opportunity to heal those. In essence, they have to remodel the bone. If you, It's not uh, exactly healing, but cutting those cutting cones across the crack and reinforcing it is what needs to be done. So at some point, the debt has to be erased. If not, the bone's going to fail. Here's an area, here, here's an example that shows how efficient that is in many instances. Here's a condylar fracture. See, we put it back together. The second picture is interoperative. The third picture has screws in, but in spite of the fact that we've compressed it to where the fracture um, disappeared on the radiographs, what actually happens is you have a little crack. You can't put all the hills in all the valleys perfectly. You can get good enough, it looks like it on x-rays, but at five months you see that um, there's a, a white line where that other arrow is, and that shows where the bone is filled in new bone. Now once it gets filled in, here's the two-month picture on the left-hand side which shows it initially getting filled in, then those orange canals start cutting across there and changing it back to normal bone. Um, that the canals are cutting through cortical bone up there where I'm showing you, and I'm showing you a cancellous bone, although the distal cannon bone is almost cortical. Um, and, and the top right-hand uh, picture is a little different. So why is all this important? It goes to understanding why a horse gets lame. Lameness is, not, is a sign, not a disease. And that's the one problem we have the most difficulty um, getting some trainers and owners to understand. Lameness is a sign that something is going on. It's not the disease itself. Now, from, from their perspective, it's the disease that's keeping the horse from performing. But you can't lose sight of the fact that something is causing lameness. And so what, <coughs> what causes pain? It's inflammation. 
And those are the, the Latin terms for pain, heat, swelling, and redness on the bottom. Well, in the horse, uh, the options as far as uh, the principal producers of inflammation are on the left-hand side, but in the horse, especially the racehorse, it'll be all trauma. Virtually all fractures in the racehorse are stress fractures, and stress fractures are defined as fractures that are, create, that are caused by multiple submaximal loads. Um, a maximal load is going to cause a bone to fracture in one load. And when that happens, especially in a horse's bone, they will explode because they're so strong that they store so much energy that when the fracture occurs, they just explode. So most of the fractures we have in racehorses are stress fractures. Repetitive cyclic stress to the skeleton is the primary cause of lameness, and it's also the driver of the remodeling. You have to do damage in order to make the skeleton stronger. And getting that right is sort of like uh, drying your clothes with a blowtorch. If you get it exactly right, it works good, but if you overdo it, you burn the clothes up. So um, that's kind of a trainer's job. High-speed exercise in history and catastrophic racing injuries in thoroughbreds. Um, this is Leah Esberg's um, paper, and I cited this last year. So the short ha that in that study that they did, horses that had accumulated a total of 35 furlongs of race and timed work distance in two months compared to a horse with 25 furlongs accumulated had an estimated... 3.9 or four times the likelihood of a catastrophic injury. So th this is an interesting um, statistic and kind of was the branching off for an, a, a different way of thinking, which I'm gonna, eventually going to come around to. So all horses get the same diseases, but the level of performance and the extreme ability of the thoroughbred racehorse magnifies its skeletal effects because their skeleton is the minimum that they can get by with. That's why they're fast. So why do races have so much trouble? They have a wonderful cardiovascular system. Todd spoke about this in people. We have to train and train and train because our limiting system by and large is the cardiovascular system. The, in the horse, it's the musculoskeletal system. First of all, because it's very slight to begin with. It's nowhere near what they need to race. It requires the most training of all their systems and so therefore sustains the most wear and tear. It has to literally be modeled into a racehorse skeleton. So starting from zero, in, in that picture that's in the lower right-hand corner, which I'll keep coming back to, that horse started with that perfectly cylindrical hollow bone. And, and he got to the bone that was most efficient for its job. And, and this is a hind leg and we always talk about front legs, and I'm going to show you some x-rays, mostly front legs we deal with in the clinical disease, but look how much adaptation a hind leg has to make as well. And the hind leg ends up almost triangular as opposed to the front leg ends up oval. And that's because that's what they need. They have a system of adaptive training that models the skeleton in a work-specific scenario. Now, all of us, when we went to veterinary school, learned about Julius Wolf in the 1890s where he, he made an observation um, and uh, I guess made a career of it, what's Wolf's Law, that bone is laid down where strength is needed and removed where strength is unnecessary, and that was made in people. But it's the same thing in the horse, but it's really extreme in the horse. But there's one additional factor, especially in the horse, and that is you can't just make a joint bigger than it normally is. So in the cannon bones, in the shafts, we can make them bigger. We just add bone to them to make them as strong as we want. But in the cannon bone, it's part of the fetlock joint. So you have to change the substance of the bone as opposed to the um, size and shape of the bone in order to better resist the, the forces. Now, how many loads does it require to train bone? Well, this is the paper that sort of set the, the um, it's the seminal paper on how many loads it takes for bone to respond. They started with two loads a day, then four, then six, then eight, went all the way up um, to 2,000. 2,000 loads a day to see how much um, work the bone needed to respond. And, you know, you might imagine... I'm going to ask how they did it. It was kind of interesting. They used turkeys and they put them in a vice. Uh, these turkeys are in, a, they're in this little sling where they live and they beat their wings to get fed. 
Um, and some turkeys can only need to be eat twice, uh, um, and then they get restricted. And then there's a, a group of turkeys that had to beat 2,000 times. Um, turkeys aren't real smart, but they eventually figured it out. 36 cycles a day made the bone stronger. Anything more than 36 cycles a day had no effect. So bone trains to the level of work that it sees, roughly. I mean, there's a certain minimum threshold, but it trains to the level of work that it sees, not the volume. The volume of work is what basically trains cardiovascular systems and interval training revolutionized human training. And they found out that Dr. Fox at Ohio State, I, I was there at the time when he was doing most of the publishing, when he found out that you could make a lot more progress if you did multiple sessions of just submaximal work for shorter distances that added up to a bigger number than you could do in one session. So in other words, instead of running um, two miles, if you ran um, eight quarters at slightly faster than what you could run two miles, the heart and lungs got better. And so interval training revolutionized human training. Well, people tried it on racehorses, and you know what we got was five-year-old maidens with splints on their hind legs. They just can't stand that much training. The, the, the heart and lungs respond so fast that the skeleton can't handle it. So those additional cycles that the heart and lungs can respond to, can't, the bone can't handle it. So that's why the limiting system in the horse is consistently the musculoskeletal system. So how much is 36 cycles? If you take a furlong, it's 660 feet. Wikipedia says Secretariat's stride was 25 feet. Um, and so that's roughly 26 cycles per furlong, which means you got to go, go about one and a third furlongs to show the bone where it's going to go. So your ideal training session would look something like this. You gotta have enough volume of work to train the organs, heart, lungs, muscles. They respond differently than does bone. But you need a session of 36 cycles, slightly more than a furlong, that's a little faster than the average work so that you show the bone where we're gonna go next week. That tells the, those osteocytes with all their canaliculi, actually it shows them because it overloads them, um, that they gotta get stronger. And so then, then essentially they respond. So the effect of training balances the work and the response. It's, an, it's the essence of being a horse trainer. You got you to gotta balance enough work to train the organs, the heart and lungs, and get them fit. And as Todd said, you don't have to go nearly as many miles in a horse as you do in a person because horses have better heart and lungs than we do. But not so much work to overload the skeleton. So what happens if we get too much volume of work? for the skeleton. You get cyclic fatigue, structural damage, and structural failure, but how does that occur? Well, we have to branch into the physics enough to understand elastic and plastic deformity. If you use, look at a stress strain curve, which is on the left-hand side, if you're in the range with the first red dot, you're in the elastic deformity. That means you bend something, it goes right back to where it was, doesn't change the structure at all. Bend something, goes back, doesn't change it at all. Plastic deformity is what's illustrated on the right-hand side that if you bend something, it comes back, but it doesn't quite make it to where it was before. It leaves a little bit of damage behind. And then you bend it again, it leaves a little bit of damage behind. And that accumulated damage is what tells the skeleton that it, that it needs to get stronger, but it also does the damage. So with steel, they know where the elastic deformity is. You can build that bridge on the lower left-hand side, and as long as you stay in the elastic range until it corrodes, that steel should last forever. Unless somebody made a mistake, that bridge is never going to wear out from repetitive cyclic loading. That's because in the central dots and connections there is that the, the connections between the atoms in the crystals stay the same. If you overload it, into the plastic deformity, what happens is some of those atoms shift over. They're still bonded in a crystal, but they slide. And so they leave a little change in structure. So which, which is more stressful on a horse's bone? That horse going over the jump and landing like he's landing on his leg, or those two horses training down in the bottom? 
I mean, most people, if you look at this, uh, they would look at the horse going over the jump, see how far his fetlock goes down and how hard he's landing with the weight of the rider. And they'd, they'd pick that because those horses, those race horses are just gliding over the surface. Race training is much harder on the skeleton. The reason it's much harder is because repetitive cyclic loading and short, repetitive, cy uh, short, quick um, cycles it causes plastic deformation. And this is a, uh, from a text of mecha mechanical materials that shows this is zinc crystals where they looked at it and just see what happens in the zinc. If you cycle every 30 seconds, you get plastic deformity. If you use the same cycle every 24 hours, nothing changes because crystals actually have the capability of moving back if you don't cycle too fast. So you sort of know that if you take a piece of wire and you can bend it very slowly. And if you bend it once a day, you could go forever. But if you bend it quickly, it starts to heat up and it breaks. And that's because of plastic deformation. Now, bone has little elasticity, so it doesn't have much elastic range. If you look on the left-hand side, you can see intuitively, uh, glass is the one end of the spectrum. Glass tolerates no plastic deformation. When you get to the point where there's permanent damage, it's total. It just breaks. So it, it's totally elastic. Yet, you can keep glass in a window in the, in, the, in the big buildings, and they'll blow back and forth continuously for years. The glass doesn't break because you're staying in the elastic range. But as soon as you get in the plastic range of glass, it breaks. The other end of the spectrum is rubber. This is a stress-strain current. So stress is the amount of um, energy that's stored within the structure, and strain is defined as the change in length per unit length, meaning how much can you, uh, can you stretch it. Rubber's at the other end of the spectrum, and it, it, it's virtually totally elastic. You very seldom get into the plastic rings with rubber. So copper's in between there. Um, steel, there's an interesting hump in the steel. We use that with surgery instruments. It's called cold working. If you work steel, it actually makes it a little harder. The initial um, set of plastic deformity that you do, the steel will sort of consolidate and you can put a sharper edge on it. And so cold working steel actually helps you for a little while until you get over the top of the hump and then it starts to plastically deform. But bone elasticity is about 4%. 4% strain, it begins to get into the plastic deformation stage, so it's got very little plasticity. So this overload of repetitive cycles in a short period of time causes this progressive step up in damage. And this result, results in increased capacity because it causes that right hind shin to move from that little cylinder to that, oval, to that triangular shaped bone or in the front leg, it'll be oval. And the director of the osteocytes now, I showed this last time. Um, training is the process of overload, over-repair, overload, over-repair in manageable steps. It's steps that are manageable by the bone. It actually is the same thing applies to the heart, muscle, um, uh, heart, lungs, muscle, whatever. Yeah, the, the, the efficiency increases, and eventually... In the skeleton, we get it to where it's the right size and shape for the horse, and then you can race. So how does it respond? Well, it can change the material, as illustrated on the left-hand side, and it can make the bone denser, which it does, or it can change the shape, which it does. It can add more bone if it's not a joint, which it does. In the lower right-hand corner, it shows you the difference between a solid rod and a hollow cylinder. If you take the same amount of material in um, example A and make it into a hollow cylinder in example C, it doubles the strength. Same amount of material. So it's no accident that bones are hollow. That's structurally the best design. Here's the thing that Ed was talking about with David Nunnebaker saying about standard breads are different than thoroughbreds. The blue line is a yearling standard bread. The red line is an adult standard bread. That's how much the standard breads can and bones change. Standard breads 
the, if you look at standard bred foals, they, they tend to have bigger cannon bones than do thoroughbred foals. Thoroughbred foals tend to be smaller. But look what happens to the thoroughbred foals. They start out on that bottom dash line and they end up in the green line on top. They increase their moment of inertia, which means the distance from the center of the bone, um, at least twice, sometimes more than that. So horses are not born with racehorse skeleton. They need that repetitive cyclic loading to show those osteocytes where they've got to go. And in the front of the cannon bone, they'll double in size. The other poster child for enlargement is the caudal cortex of the tibia. It's got to at least double in size. Cannon bone eventually will get almost three times the dorsal cortical thickness most of the time. So in the shaft, it increases the size and the amount of material. It has that luxury. Um, here's an example. This is a fold that had a fracture that I put plates in, and it was a quarter horse show horse. In, in race horses, you have to take the plates out if you put them in. If you don't, they'll get lame because the elastic modulus of stainless steel and the screws connecting the hollow cylinder of the cannon bone front to back will make the horse lame when you reach race speed. So, in, but in show horses, you don't even have to take the plates out. The stiffness of bone and stainless steel, cannon bone at least, and stainless steel is so close to the same that you get no absorption around the screws and you got no pain. Well, this horse died as an adult and, the, and the, it belonged to a veterinarian, so he sent me the, the, um, uh, the horse got sent in for a, a uh, post and, and sent me a note, said, go look at the cannon bone that you plated. The plates are totally gone. Cannon bone grew right around it. But the interesting thing, if you'll look at it, look at the screws in the back cortex. That's on the right-hand side of the bone with the plate on it, uh, and the, the, of those left three, and the middle one. The screws in the back cortex are almost exactly where they were when that foal was a week old. He grew in the front, just like the hind cannon bone grew in front because that's where he needed the bone. Now, if overload and the microfracture damage generation exceeds the overrepair, then you begin to get plastic deformity or structural damage. In other words, if the horse can't keep up with the rate at which you're giving him the load to the skeleton, and, and I'm not gonna talk about this, but there's a lot of individual variation. Some horses can take everything you can throw at them, and some horses will never be race horses, no matter how slow you train them. They just can't stand it. So if you don't have adequate repair, you get plastic deformity, micro damage, and then eventually stress fractures. And those are stress fractures because they result from multiple submaximal loads. So theoretically, what you might say is that once we get a horse made, we get him to where he's got elastic bones. Not mean that they'll stretch like rubber, but they never get out of the elastic range. Well, that never occurs in biologic systems, or rarely. The, the, there's enough damage that the biologic system has to adapt. And so, in actual fact, what happens is something that's more like this. Remember I said there's an exercise debt created when a horse is exercising at or near its maximal load. You're doing a little bit of micro damage. Now, when you get in a position where you're getting damage, a lot of the remodeling shuts off. The bone denotes or, or de devotes all of its energy to making new bone. And when this goes all the way to its end, it shows up as callus. If it really gets in trouble, it makes a lot of real disorganized bone because it doesn't have time to organize it. So you, you'll see a knot or a callus, and that's overcoming this progressive injury or deformity, or it could be an actual fracture uh, in an unstable situation. But if you got a lot of callus being formed then you, um, in response to exercise, well, then you got a debt that you're trying to pay. And the bone is not particularly um, concerned with making quality bone. So at some point, you got to pay that debt. And when a horse bucks his shins, you turn him out for a while. Let him pay the debt. Let him get it stronger, and then he comes back. Or that's one option if you can't train him slow enough. 
That little cone in the middle is a representative, uh, a representation of a secondary osteon. A secondary osteon removes damaged bone and replaces it with really good bone. What actually happens more in the horse is what's on the right-hand side of that um, plastic drawing there is they just add lamellae to the outside, to make the bone bigger. Well, where do we see this? Remember I showed the pictures on the left um, with uh, Sue Stover showing what happens when a horse goes from a neonate to a walking foal. And, and that's the histopath slide on the left where you have those little cavities. Dave Nunnemaker found those same cavities in buck shins. And clinically, we see that as that uh, line that I marked with the green arrow. And the reason that is, is until that outer bone becomes mature enough that it becomes stiff enough that you can stick it down to the parent bone, these canals stay open for some reason. They're just not filled in. They're not absorption canals. Secondary osteons look like that osteon that's circled in the red. That's a secondary osteon. That's a bone that had a little crack and for some reason, it had to send one of those cutting cones, which are in the blue, across that crack and stabilize it. But this is how the adaptation has to be made where when the horse starts to get into trouble, he adds a lot of bone. It's not particularly well organized if, it's, if the damage is going too fast. And we see all perturbations of what's happening in that scenario. These are young shins, a whole bunch of different young shins. You see different looks for all the different shins. Eventually, you want to get to that shin on the right where that, all of those little canals are gone. We didn't even know this existed until we got digital radiography because we couldn't get enough detail to show it. But for most really active shins, where they're tender on the surface, but the horse might not be lame, this is what it starts out as. This is what I mentioned when Ed was talking about the two-year-old training. One reason that you want to train two-year-olds is you see that connection, see the double-headed arrow where it marks the newly formed bone and then the circular arrow marks the yearling shin. See what kind of difference there is in the um, previously formed shin and the newly formed shin and how there's a difference in stiffness there because the density of the newly formed bone is never as, as dense as the old bone unless you make it very slowly to where it can calcify that fast. If you pick up a horse right at the end of growth and convert those cells in the periosteum from responding to the genetic template to responding to training, you don't get that separation between. There's not as much difference you can tell this horse matured before he started training. Just by looking at that division between the mature bone and the new bone. You don't want that to happen. That's why you have, you have all the cell population and the blood supply in a growing horse that you don't want it to atrophy. Because as soon as he stops growing, it's going to atrophy. You want it to stay so you don't have to recreate it again. When you recreate it again, you get a differential stiffness in the, uh, in the two components of the bone, and that's where it shows there. How is that important? Where do the stress fractures go? They usually go through the, they actually usually go through the intermediate bone and either break out through the front where they become clinical or eventually, um, oops, I forgot. I'm going to come back to this when I get to talk specifically about uh, should we train right-handed or left-handed. The stress fractures will go down to that lamellae and then they'll tend to turn and go up the bone because there's a difference in stiffness and it's easier to propagate. So cyclic fatigue results in work-specific changes and we always train left-handed. This forces training on the left lean in the turns, and is there evidence for structural overload from this practice? That's the question Ed asked me. Perhaps in condylar fractures. 
Perhaps not. Uh, uh, this is, the counter fracture is, re, is a real interesting injury to me. I mean, it's the one we see the most often in the place the horse has to make the most ad- adaptation. So in summary, it's exercise induced. It's an accumulation of stress in excess of repair. And it prop, the propagation depends upon the, the post-op stress. The numbers I'm going to show you are from these two papers that we published in EVJ, I don't know, uh, 1999. These are the age of the condylar fractures that are in the study. You can see they roughly represent the training populations, but the older horses have a little less trouble, but they're not immune to it. They still create exercise that, um, as we spoke about. The fracture locations are what are important to us because if we want to answer the question, is there a detriment to left-hand training because that means are we repeating the same stress in one direction in excess of the other direction? So we looked at fracture locations, medial and lateral, right, left. There's not a statistical difference there. But look at this difference. The yellow columns on the left-hand side are incomplete non-displaced fractures. By and large, the left forelimb gets incomplete non-displaced fractures, less severe, easier to treat. The right forelimb, they usually displace. They're much more severe fracture than happens on the left forelimb. Now, they're under the same general mechanical loads, and I think this has to do with the force that creates the fracture. So what about in England? What happens there? Because they don't train left-handed. Well, this is a paper fairly recently from um, Peter Clegg's lab and Tim Parkin, who has done a lot of work for the Jockey Club. And the important sentence there is that that the catastrophic condylar fractures affect the right forelimb in England twice as often as the left forelimb. Now, you always have to look at the English data, and this has a bunch of steeple chasers in it. So that's why I don't know whether that really is translatable to our scenario or not, but it's certainly not a black and white England to the US. Now, here's why we think the right is a a worse fracture. Watch this horse come around the turn. This is chestnut horse, he's on the left lead. Watch the right limb plow into the ground and then the lead limb, the left limb. If you look at it, for the most part, the right limb always plows deeper and sheds up more um, dirt on this dirt track than does the left limb. The right limb, uh, uh, a splash for, for lack of a better effect, the splash is higher consistently when they're doing this. And it's also the same in the hind leg. If you play that over and over and watch the hind leg um, go, the right hind, which is the first end of the track on the left lead, is going to splash higher than the left lead. Okay, he'll run off the screen here in a minute, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the mechanics of of why that occurs when a horse is training. It occurs naturally in relation to the surface that the horse is working over, but it also, we can alter it with shoeing appliances and with the surface of the track, and this is why. Now, this, these limbs are stick drawings of the horse in the top, um, showing where he's galloping, roughly. And the fetlock and the coffin joint are essentially reciprocal angles. That means if you change one, you've got to change the other. And the reason that's true is because vertical is vertical and horizontal is horizontal, and the horse has to carry the weight over the ground. So if he's going to carry the weight over the ground, and he's got to have a vertical weight-faring force, like you see uh, on the, that's the non-lead leg that's carrying the weight there um, in the picture. When you see on, on that limb, If you change his coffin joint, you got to change his fetlock joint too. Because vertical is always vertical. You got to resist gravity. And we hope the surface of the track is virtually flat, which effectively um, in the plane that is 90 degrees to gravity, it should be. So the effects of an angle change are significant. If you increase the flexion in the coffin joint, you have to increase flexion in the fetlock joint. The horse doesn't have any choice as long as he's going to keep moving forward and carry his weight. So the more you change one, the more you change the other, and what happens in the fetlock is you start dropping the cannon bone further and further. It increases the amount of flexion, so that's going to increase the load on the suspensory apparatus. 
And the deeper he digs into the surface, the more that effect. So the plow down of his toe affects the angle of his coffin joint, which affects the angle of his fetlock joint. That's why most of the injuries are in the fetlock joint. And why a toe grab doesn't affect the coffin joint, but affects the fetlock joint, is roughly this. If you increase the baking, breaking power of the plow down, now fatal injuries in, in Sue Stover's summary paper that um, Ed cited, it's 50%, but fatal injuries in other studies are as high as 95%. If you include ruptured suspensories, ruptured distal sesamoid and ligaments, fractured sesamoids, condylar fractures, all of those that are related there to the suspensory apparatus, there's a huge amount in the fetlock joint. The increased breaking of the forelimb increases the, the flexion of the coffin joint. If you add a toe grab, especially a big toe grab, it's going to plow harder. That plow tends to turn the coffin joint down. And then that affects the fetlock joint in return, and then the, the, the suspensory apparatus is loaded heavier than it would be if you didn't have that situation. This horse is, uh, you can see the white arrow, they're pointing to his right forelimb, he's on the left lead. The right forelimb plows more because the horse's weight's behind the limb whenever they're going into the ground. On the, when he gets to the lead leg, he's already over top of it. And, and that's why you can see a difference on the high-speed cinematography and the things that affect the plow down. If you increase the resistance on the front of his hoof with a toe grab, it's going to tend to turn him down. The stiffness of the surface has an effect, and the length of the slide or the ability of the material to a, a really loose track, they're going to plow a lot deeper because they can go farther. There's not as much resistance. This horse is trotting, um, and I just caught him on the uh, artificial surface. And you can see artificial surface doesn't plow very much because it has a lot of substance to it. So it's a lot different on dirt. There's another horse. Uh, this is... Um, uh, dark bay horse this time and he's on the same lead going around the same turn and you can see again that he's hitting with the right forelimb with his weight behind the limb and he hits on the lead leg largely with the leg over top of the limb so I believe that's the explanation for why at least on dirt I don't know why um, the English data um, shows that the, their right forelimbs are more common either. Maybe, maybe this has nothing to do, and maybe I'm lying to you, but the mechanics will drop the fetlock farther on the right forelimb and increase the load. Our knowledge is that this disease is greatly improved. We used to only take the x-ray on the left, but now we know if you, if you see the white spot on the left x-ray between the sesamoid and P1, that's where the heavy load is. That's where the load increases whenever the horse plows into the surface and increases the load on the fetlock. So you got to take the view on the right in order to see where the action is. And Mary showed this um, um, in a cadaver horse on a normal leg, but this is a horse getting a fetlock arthrodesis because he ruptured um, both uh, sesamoids. He has a perfectly normal, and we saw off the condyle as part of the surgery, but what was interesting is he has a perfectly normal looking cartilage joint surface, but he has a bruise in the subchondral bone. When I took the cartilage off in the picture that's on the top right, you can see that, that bruise. Every thoroughbred that, that I've ever fused where we use this approach, if they've raced for any period of time recently, it, it doesn't apply to brood mirrors, because they've already paid their debt. Recently, they'll have some change like this. And then that change results in the bottom right-hand picture where you see the little wedge-shaped piece of bone that occurs there. And then that, that, that progresses up the bone into the condylar fracture. So in looking at if the repetitive stress is the driver of skeletal remodeling, and look, going back to Leah Esberg's uh, uh, paper, of, remember that's between 25 and 35 furlongs, we wanted to know, can we predict the condylar fracture? Is there a number of furlongs that you have to stay between in a two-month period of time in order to avoid a condylar fracture? Or, I mean, essentially another way to, to ask that, is there a number of cycles per time that is too much? Or is it a bad step that in, or, and the injuries are just inevitable? Well... 
It's actually likely both. Some surfaces are more consistent than others, so you're, not, you're gonna have fewer of those irregular steps. The poster child for that was way back in the in late 80s when the AAP did the first track study at Minnesota. And they demonstrated that the place where the water truck went on and off the track had a higher incidence of injuries. They also demonstrated that the place where the water truck drove around the, the um, oval and had its booms out to the side, it would be like about the four path um, on the racetrack is harder because you're packing it consistently with the water truck and that led to the water trucks with the long booms only on one side which they actually drive out. So the surface has some effect. It increases the number of irregular steps that you might have, the, you're going to have these little cracks in normally training horses, all variations of them. Some will be a little clinical. Sometimes we don't pick them up until they're already healing. No one ever really knew that they're there. But if you load that bone abnormally, it's like having a crack in a coffee cup where you might use that coffee cup for a year until one day you hit it just right and the whole thing falls apart. If you hit it just right, the, the, the crystals in that um, uh, cannon bone are going to be vulnerable. The energy it takes to fracture a normal can bone is huge. I, I used to run the, the AO course at Ohio State, and we had the frac we now use plastic bones, but we used to use um, regular cadaver bones, and we were wanting to do an exercise on cannon bone fractures. So we had to fracture a bunch of cannon bones so that the participants could plate them, put them back together. So we went over to necropsy and got some cannon bones, and the first thing that we did was put the put the can of bone in the vise and put a pipe on it and bend it. Well, we couldn't bend it hard enough to break it, so a couple of us got on it and tried to bend it, and we broke the vise. So then we stuck it in the end of the, there was these big necropsy tables, they got rolled edges on it, and we stuck it in there, and we tried to bend it in there. Um, we ended up bending the table. We finally got it to break by sticking it in the drain with a towel in the drain and driving over it with a forklift. But the, but the fractures were so high energy that they resulted in a bag of little bone pieces. We had the, Rick, if you tell them that I was the one that bent that necropsy table, I'm, I'm never going to talk to you again. I'm scared of Mr. Jackson. I don't know, he's probably not even still there, but <laughs> I was scared of him. He's the guy that ran the lab. Um, but the, the energy it takes to fracture a cannon bone in a normal cannon bone is gigantic. So it so it'll just splinter the bone. So what we're dealing with is a vulnerable bone that gets an abnormal load. Normal bones are not vulnerable. They're perfectly normal bones. I mean, you can get such a high load that you're going to break the cannon bone, but we almost, I mean, I say, I don't know if I've ever seen an adult cannon bone short of a car wreck where the horse was ever able to break the bone. They'll dislocate the angle, ankle, they'll dislocate the knee, the cannon bones are just too strong. They won't break them. So what we wanted, Jamie Hayden helped me with this one. What we were trying to look at is, so we took 162 condylar fractures uh, that we had done, that they had records for at, uh, well, these are the surgeries that I had done in a, in a period of time. Um, and we looked at two horses from the, those horses' last race to see if they had a higher level of cycles uh, high speed furlongs in a two month period of time than did the control horses. And so the, there should be a decimal point after um, the, the, between the first, uh, after, uh, between the second and the third num number from the right. That's how um, you can, we can do uh, half furlongs. So that red box on the right hand side, 60 days for before the race, the total furlongs those horses had gone were a, a mean of 35 and a median of 36. It means the spread's really small. They're all going the same amount. But the non-surgery horses were training at the same level, 34 and 36. So 
all of the horses in the study on the average, now we can dissect this data. I still have some hope that we might get guidelines out of this data when we go through it in several um, different ways. But in the 30 days before the race, in the 60 days before the race, or the total furlongs that the horse had gone, there's no difference. They're all above Leah Esberg's 35 high-speed furlongs. Every one of them's training on the edge of its physiology. And so this is a puzzle that we need to unravel, but um, I may not live long enough for us to know, but someday we'll know. Um, it, it's multifactorial, certainly. It has a lot to do with the speed of the furlongs you're going, and we're dependent upon the, the, the description of high-speed furlongs. We just took it for granted they were breezing. This is, is Ray, Ray, yeah, Ray's here. This is um, his published assault schedule of training that was in your column, I believe, um, of how he trained. But if you look at it, the speed is nowhere near what most of our horses are breezing now heading to the Kentucky Derby. Assault still holds the largest winning margin in the Kentucky Derby by eight links, but he went in 206 and three-fifths. Those other horses must have been really slow. A good trotter currently can go a mile and a quarter that fast. Um, so they're really, they, they, there's a significant difference in the um, rate at which they're going. They, he went a lot of furlongs. If you just take the furlongs that he went, he went 140 furlongs, if you consider those all high speed. So it says work, you know, but, but he's actually going some of those works. They're going four furlongs um, and not much uh, slower, uh, not much faster than what we go five now. So speed has a big difference. And I don't know how we can be able to work in the speed as a, re uh, as a multiplier of the number of furlongs. Um, certainly, uh, it's a complicated puzzle. So because of, the English, because of the English data, I'm not sure that left-handed training really affects our horses that much, but it certainly seems to affect the characteristic of the fracture when we see them. Now here's another study that we did um, on stress fractures. This is almost exclusively a disease of the metacarpus in the racing thoroughbred, and it's pretty rare when you're on non-dirt surfaces. The pathogenesis is multiple cyclic loads and progressive accumulation and damage and excess of repair, and it's predisposed by changes in the biomechanics. This, this is what um, Ed was talking about, about thoroughbreds trained to train and standardbreds trained to race. When a thoroughbred is training in the forelimb, he's going to make a cannon bone that's roughly equal to that cartoon I've got in the upper right. And that's medial and lateral. The arrows are meant to go down the front. The cannon bone's going to be thickest in front from everything up to galloping. But as soon as you move to breezing, the compression surface of the cannon bone moves laterally. And that's what Dave was talking about. When you put strain gauges on him, the compression moves over to the lateral side, but the lateral side's not prepared. He hasn't had enough of those 36 cycle works to show him where he's going in a slow enough period of time that he can handle them. If you go too fast, they're gonna buck their shins. And then if you go to an excess, what happens is because in the compression mode, um, the shear plane, or the tension between the molecules, is always at 45 degrees, and so these stress fractures broke at 45, break at 45 degrees. In a normal cannon bone, the front's uh, multiple times bigger than the back cortex. I already showed you that with the x-rays. Dorsal metacarpal disease, if, if you, you occasionally catch a horse that's in the midst of training its bone, on the right-hand side, you can see how many of those stress fractures there are. What, when you have a lot of stress fractures like that, I love to get those because the referring veterinarian and the trainer a lot of times look at this and say, look at this horse, he's got a dozen or 15 stress fractures in front of his hand. That horse is gonna be okay because he doesn't have one stress fracture that's predominant like the rest of them. But I'll get back to that in just a minute. Distribution of the 61 stress fractures in this study, 91% left for them. So is there value in training right-handed? You bet there is in the front cannon bone. That we're overloading the left front on all of the left lead work that we do. 
When you put a stress fracture in bone, the reason a single stress fracture is bad is that if you look at the stress lines, they should be evenly distributed through the cannon bone like that second picture, but you put the stress fracture in and it'll distribute all the stress lines to that one fracture. And then what happens? The stress fracture propagates deeper into the bone until it hits an interface between two stiffnesses of bone. And where does that occur? At the yearling shin. And so that's why they'll go up the bone for the most part in the yearling shin. And if you don't pay attention, sometimes you get a broken cannonball. So there's probably some advantage in considering training both ways for, for the um, shins of a horse's front leg. This is a tendon study that was, just came out in June. And the ages of the horses in here are pretty much the distribution of horses that are training in our area. The distribution of tendon injuries, strongly left fore. Now, I don't know exactly why that is, but there it is. That's the data. And the effect on racing status and all that, the older the horse is, the, we showed in the paper, the less likely he is to come back from a bowed tendon. So why is it easier on a horse's skeleton to do these things where the surfaces are irregular, the loads are abrupt and irregular, and the riders are larger, why is that easier than race training? That's a 100-mile trail ride illustrated right there. It's because the loads don't come in that repetitive, plastic deformity, frequent cycle in a short period of time that overloads the bone. They don't come fast enough that they overload the bone. For virtually all those other um, disciplines, you don't have buck shins, you don't have common fractures, you don't have the diseases we see in the racing thoroughbred because they don't have plastic def deformation and micro damage to the bone to the extent that we have because we group our cyclic loads in such a short period of time. So how can we alter this? Well, Theoretically, working in straight lines, but the English data might um, cast doubt on that. We have to figure out, other than the fact that there's a lot of steeple chasers in there, and I don't know if they're jumping so that they're landing primarily on the right limb. I'm, I don't know enough about steeple chasing to know that. Maybe they're increasing the load that way. Certainly, varying the gates is useful. We tend not to jog as much as we should. A lot of trainers jog quite a bit, and most of them that do have pretty good records as far as their training of their horses. If you just overdo the galloping, I hate people to say we're galloping him an awful lot, three or four miles every day to put a good foundation under them. Those horses, they tend to have a fair number of bone problems because you just wear the bone out. You want to be conscious of the fact that multiple or, or relatively frequent short works is probably better for the bone than fewer real long works or breezes. And then speed fits into that, and, and I don't know that. So at what level is cyclic fatigue creating structural damage? Um, when Lenny asked me when he did the re review for the blood horse, so what's the next big step in veterinary medicine? Equipment, techniques, whatever. I think it's information education. We now know enough about the biology of some of these systems that I think when we figure this out, when you can say to the trainer, if you're doing this and this and this, you probably don't want to accumulate this many furlongs. Now, it's not a simple number. Horses aren't made of steel. and steel, that's a simple number. But We've got biology, we've got a horse that's able to repair his fractures, we've got a composite material, it's not a simple crystal, all that goes in. But once we figure this out, and part of the, part of the um, answer might be that we should train some in both directions, because it seems to make sense for some of our injuries, but it's not a simple answer. So... Should you entertain the idea of allowing some horses to train in both directions? I think it's smart. I, I don't think it'll prevent all our injuries, just like nothing pr prevents all of our injuries. You know, we were going to have no more injuries once we got rid of anabolic steroids. Guess what? We were going to have no more injuries with all the things that make it in the popular press. The horse has to make such a huge adaptation, and they're so good at it. And as Dr. Lavin already said, if, I, 
I tried to find the reference, which I read some time, some time ago, but I, I can't come up with it. If anybody knows where it is, but it said that the, the thoroughbred of 1900 and the thoroughbred of 2000, the thoroughbred in 2000 is one hand taller than the average thoroughbred in 1900. And I don't know where the data came from. So in 100 years, they got taller. Certainly, the abolition of the intestinal parasite has changed the horse. It used to be that colic eventually got every horse, so to speak. I mean, almost every horse is, it was rare to see a 30-year-old horse. Now it's commonplace, and we worry about them because they get all these metabolic diseases that have to do with old age, just like we do as people. Um, and so when they run out of teeth, that's usually when you have to euthanize them. That didn't used to happen. So um, we have a lot to understand about the horse. They're really good at what they do. Um, we have more data to need, but it, it might make sense to train them in both directions, at least for a few of those high-speed furlongs. Questions? I'm going to uh, wait for the, if you won't mind, work for, I've got a middle ear infection and I can't hear my wife when she talks, so I'm not going to hear you from the back of the room, although she would say that that's a common malady for me. Um, thank you. Um, I used to be a track vet at Flemington in Australia and they would have days where it was Melbourne way or, or Sydney way because the jurisdictions raced in different directions, as, as you probably know. So um, my understanding is the way that originally occurred was from some comments about sacroiliac disease, which was, which was quite profound when they did the obligatory necropsies on these horses. Um, and I don't know whether that was a, an aside or an additional piece of information, but those horses certainly went both ways round. Did you like it? I think it's it? absolutely brilliant, yeah. It was not like, we definitely had a choice of leg to x-ray in those days, put it that way. So that seemed to be helpful, you think? Very, very helpful. And of course, it was flat, so obviously that was interesting. Mm. But going back to your comments about Peter Clegg's data, which I think is really, really poignant, one of the interesting things that might be worth, and I, I should go back and look at that paper to, to know it better, but if the groups are broken down in that paper in terms of flat horses hurdlers, which are the horses that come straight out of flat training, you know, and as you know, those, those fences are much more flimsy, they go much faster, and then put a national hunt horse as the true steeplechaser, where the age is older, because horses usually progress through hurdling to steeplechasing. Obviously, you know, the flat horses, they'll be lucky if they see one bend, even if they do a mile, they, they may only see one, maybe two bends, but then everybody else, obviously, obviously they're going to be using combinations of bends on those tracks. And there's certainly, in, in just going through the different steeplechase tracks or the hurdle, the jump tracks, there's a, there's a predisposition for them to be actually counterclockwise. I don't think that they were broken down. There were 75 horses that were in the group, as I, if I remember. And no, I they, think they weren't. Yeah, they were just catastrophic injuries, mm -hmm. which is part of the... Uh, the difficulty, those are the samples that we get, which is why we were really interested in looking at what about a Conler fracture, which is doesn't blow the whole bone apart, but obviously it got to the level of with it just fatigue. And that maybe there was, those horses were training more, but it was amazing when we looked at the data, all of the horses were outside the limit that Leah Esberg proposed for the California horses. Um, so that's scary. Yes. Since, since the mic's here, I'll take advantage. Um, I think you alluded to this a couple times in your talk. Uh, you mentioned early on the horse that um, just doesn't seem to get through the remodeling and will never be a racehorse. And then I really liked your data at the end comparing starts and uh, speed work in the two groups. I get asked um, occasionally about inherited genetic determinants for bone remodeling and efficiency in bone remodeling between horses and wondered if you had any, I wondered if that was relevant, perhaps the work you've done with the group in Newmarket or any thoughts you have on that and the horses you've seen over the years. You're gonna, you're gonna get a personal bias now. Um, 
I don't think the ability to remodel the bone is, is um, very highly inherited. Certainly there's some families that are tougher than others. I think what the horse inherits is their ability to withstand discomfort and pain. And some horses will go out and train no matter what. And the horses, by and large, that can't make it through the training, they don't have unusual diseases. Those horses, you just can't train them through it. And we used to call it track sour whenever they got to the level of their bones hurt. They didn't want to train anymore, wouldn't get in the gate. Used to load just fine, but now they won't get in the gate because they know it hurts. And those horses don't have the ability to, to train at the level that some horses do. Now, what makes the difference? I, I'm going to name this horse because I named her last year. The horse that amazes me was Serena's song. 34 starts in three years, never missed a dance, retired with the cleanest legs you ever saw. And she got trained hard and at high level. And you could throw anything at her and it didn't seem to bother him. But then there are some horses that, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe there is a genetic um, problem, but the horses that we seem to see lots of problems are don't have outstanding problems. They have outstanding responses to it. And then, so the good horses may be dangerous, more dangerous. They can put up with that disadvantage. Well, you got to know your horse a lot better if you have a good horse. But just as far as Familial inheritance of the ability to respond to training, I don't know. I certainly don't think it's as important as that innate sense of the trainer when they're going too fast. And what that is, I, I, I mean, some of them just have it, and some trainers have a difficulty of knowing when that horse isn't responding well. So maybe it's genetic, but their ability to... To, to do the stuff that they need to do to make a racehorse skeleton, I mean, those, those tend to be good horses. So you don't think that a model to test, a hypothesis to test between your two groups, the ones that develop the fractures and the ones that don't, would be the ones that develop the fractures are remodeling at a slower rate and less efficiently? Uh, I, it could be. I mean, that would be an explanation for why if you give them the same amount of work that they, they, they break. Uh, I don't know. It could be a genetic difference. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I tend to be skeptical um, of it, but I, I don't, I'm not smart enough to know. So maybe, maybe there is a genetic difference if you just looked at the ones that fractured. But there's so many horses that get close to the fracture level and the trainers pick it up. You know, we, we do many, many fewer breakdown fetlock arthrodesis for breakdowns than, than we did 10 years ago, and even fewer than we did 20 years ago. And the main reason is we know more about the disease, and trainers are more aware. No one ever heard of bruised cannon bones 20 years ago. First of all, we couldn't show it with the x-ray technology that we had then. Um, and second of all, we just thought they were track sour. They were tired of being on the racetrack. Those horses hurt. And so if they're hurting because they're not genetically able to respond as fast, well, that would, that would be an explanation. I mean, it would, it, it would certainly be attractive in some sense. But my favorite gene story is the one... Do you all know who Black Ruby is? I'm certainly Rick knows who Black Ruby is. <laughs> She's a mule in California that for about eight or nine years, you couldn't beat her. And since you can't breed mules, they cloned her several times. 11, I believe, was the amount of clones they made out of it. Those 11 clones could not run me. So they have exactly the same genetic material as Black Ruby, but why was she so good? I think that's the attraction of horse racing. You can't just go out and buy the best genes, because even if you buy the best genes, unless you do everything else right, Oh, that's a, where's Mary? That maybe that's nurture, I guess. And even if you do everything else right, some horses just are, they have it between the ears, and 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 nobody knows what causes that. So. Yeah. Hello. Joe. Yeah, Larry. Since uh, the stress 
fractures are cumulative and it inhibits bone remodeling, then you're going to need to have some time off to allow re proper remodeling of the stress fractures. Or just maybe reduced exercise. Yeah. But how much time would you recommend off? And at what, see, if you have a horse that's in training, when do you need to take it out of training? How long do you need to leave it out of training? All right, I'm, I'm going to give you um, a clinical impression here now with, with some data. Most fractures heal in about, if they're in a stable situation, most fractures will heal about 60 days. They're totally stable. They will be bridged across with all the bone they're going to make in about 60 days, and then they start in the remodeling period. You know, it certainly depends upon the, um, the particulars related to the fracture because in a stress fracture in the shin, if you just turn them out, the reoccurrence rate is greater than 50%. And it's because there's no stimulus to finish the healing in that shin. They, they heal as good as they're going to get for uh, pasture activity. And then they don't go any farther. So they still have a weaker area in the bone. So when you come back and train and you start breezing again, that's why the stress still concentrates there and that fracture opens up. The recurrence rate's really high with those. So... That's why we operate them, is because we, we cause the bone to, to stabilize and remodel. But if you have a stable Connor fracture, I guess that's probably, in my mind, the easiest one to, to, to look at and say, 60 days, they're pretty much healed. Now, they won't be remodeled, so how much remodeling you need depends upon what the quality of the joint surface is and all that. You might have to wait longer for that really dense bone. Once you get to 120 days, your incidence of retraining injuries, such as tibial stress fractures, go up. So that has bone has gone far enough that they've done so much um, changing of the shape of the bone. They actually make the bone more porous with a, with a lot of remodeling debt that, that they've gone so far they make the shins weaker. And Dave showed that with... Um, uh, Dave Nunnemaker with the histopath on his shins that if you take those horses out of training, they'll make them a lot weaker. They, they create a lot of cutting cones across. And so it takes a long time for that. That takes six months or so to get back to the normal. Um, the Sue Stover looked at stress fractures in tibias. And once you get to 120 days, uh, I'm, a horse, a period of 120 days, out of exercise, the incidence of stress the incidence of stress fractures she went backwards, and it was statistically higher in horses that were coming off a 120 day or more layup. I believe that's right. I mean that's that's pretty pretty close to the to the data. So there's a time in between there, which is sort of the art of interpreting the injury, where you should be at the end of the repair period, but you shouldn't have gotten so far in the remodeling period that you've weakened the bone. So that's why personally for me, for most injuries, I'm gonna try to have them back um, at between 60 and 120 days, depending upon the injury, if I can. And, and so uh, that's what it's based on. But let's say that the horse wasn't injured I mean, just a horse that's been in training that has accumulated these microfractures that you say they all have, how much time do they need off in the course of a year? Well, I, I think the 60-day off time is, is what I would choose because if there is pretty good data in the exercise physiology field, and you probably know um, this data better than I do, it has to do with the horse's um, aerobic capacity, but that does not detrain much for five weeks, and then it detrains really fast for the horse's ability for to the VO2 max, the amount of oxygen that they can utilize in a certain period of time. So ex if you can extrapolate that at all to the other systems, there must be some time at which they're relatively... Um, the, the remodeling doesn't get geared up so high that they have additional problems from it. So if, I, if somebody's going to ask me how much time do I give a horse off, the um, first question I would ask them is, what's a horse going to do? Because there's a huge difference between keeping them in the shed and row and walking them. You know, if someone, if someone says, 
I, I got this horse, I'm going to give him some time off. I'm just going to keep him in the shed row and walk him for a couple months. You might as well put an X through him for the next year. Those horses don't come back because they don't have any stress at all. But if they're in the paddock moving around on a continual basis, the paper that Travis Tull did where we looked at the bruises on the bottom of the cannon bone, if they don't have any change in shape of the bottom of the cannon bone, 75% of them were healed and sound at 60 days. 25% took 90 days. We had to recheck them one more month. And so that's probably as close to a normal skeletal remodeling scenario as you can get. So uh, the evidence, if you kind of stack it all up, 60 days is probably good, 120 days is probably bad, and the individual injury fits in between someplace. There's a question on the back row. We over, we over time. One more question. Go, go ahead. You no, I just wanted to um, re-emphasize your comment there about the sacroiliac um, issues there and the um, backtracking, if you will, here, that we use in the States. Um, I kind of have an interesting background both in the racing world and dressage world, and we use a lot of... Um, trotting work to improve the canter and dressage. At the same time, I worked in some barns where we had the 80, 90, 100 buyer figure horses uh, that we backtracked a lot jogging. And um, the jogging improves the canter work, improves the lope work. Um, it also helps to improve the horse's way of going. And so I think that there is some um, consideration that should be given to training horses backwards or backtracking, if you will, and training both sides there. Um, I think that there would be some value in exploring that further um, for scientific um, emphasis or reaffirmation that that is good for the horses. So you got two votes for to go so open the track. <laughs> it says, oh, you're sacrificing his liquor. <laughs> <laughs> But I guess we're out of questions. Wait. Thank you very much, Dr. Bramlage. That was just incredible. Uh, again, thank you all for coming. For those of you who are involved in dinner, it's on the second floor clubhouse uh, at 6.30. And uh, also we hope to see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>